useful theoretical insights into the relationship of religion and violence and more and more you see uh, internationally, internationally now also a scholarly recognition. It became available the, the possibility to become a conscientious objector in Austria in 1975 and I uh, did my civil service, which you have to do as an alternative service, in '78. So I was one of the the first who did that, and because I was so attracted by peace movement, by Gandhi, by other examples that I learned in this uh, engagement, that I also wanted to make a, a claim to stop this. Uh, military nonsense. I mean, at that time we had these discussions about the double drag decision of NATO, this confrontation of the Cold War, and being at that time quite an idealistic, maybe utopian young person, I, I, I felt we have to do something against it. So Shirar explains the source of violence in the imitation of the desire of others in mimetic rivalry. He comes very close to the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes. If any two men desire the same thing, which nevertheless they cannot both enjoy, they become enemies. So the first pillar is human beings are mimetic, meaning imitative beings. As soon as uh, our basic needs are fulfilled, we still have some kind of yearning of desires but we do not actually know what to desire. So most of the time we look around and if we see people that attract us, people that we find cool, people that we adore in some way, we imitate them. And out of this imitation comes the best, meaning through imitation we develop language, we develop the capability of thinking, but uh, Imitating desires of others easily leads us into envy, jealousy and rivalry for those goods we cannot share or for those goods which cannot be enjoyed together. Let us uh, go back now to the very early stage of human development to archaic religion. And archaic religion of course is related to violence because of the scapegoat mechanism but it's already aiming for peace. Uh, archaic society developed out of the killing of uh, an arbitrary victim by the collective group in order to overcome internal troubles and he calls that the scapegoat mechanism. It's a thing we know even uh, from our own experience, the experience of mobbing of outsiders uh, and so on. But if you go to the very early beginnings of human society, you see that those groups, those early groups and communities not only killed the victim uh, or expelled the victim, but because suddenly when the victim was dead or was uh, uh, ex expelled, uh, there was solidarity, peace and harmony in the group. So the people projected that this uh, scapegoat is really the worst and the best. And just uh, to project the worst and the best into a person is already meaning to transform him into or her into a divinity. But the Bible, and that's the important difference, sides with the victim, exposing by that the violence of the persecutors. The biblical religions are not rooted in a scapegoat mechanism, but expose this mechanism. The third pillar is that after a while uh, Shirar started to read the Bible very carefully, uh, trying to find out is the Bible, is the Jewish Christian tradition, the Abrahamic tradition, also an outcome, a result of this religion coming out of this murderous founding murder at the beginning of culture. And he found out, uh, interestingly, that the basic texts in archaic mythology, in, in archaic myth and in the Bible share a common structure. All those texts talk about a single victim, or a lot of those texts talk about a single victim persecuted by a collective mob. So that's the, that's the common ground between archaic myth and the Bible. 
and this common ground justifies the 19th century uh, approach of uh, religious studies. Uh, people at that time who said, well, it's all the same. If it would be all the same, then we can say all of religion is an outcome of those founding murder. But Girard not only understood that it uh, shares a common structure, he also saw, saw that the interpretation of this uh, event, of this event of collective violence, is completely different. So, whereas the archaic myth sides with the persecutors, with the lynching mob, the biblical tradition sides with the uh, persecuted victims. That's such a significant insight that you really see there is a huge biblical difference which explains then also the development of our modern culture, our emphasis on human rights, our critique of violence. Is there also a religious answer out of the, the, of the deadlock of mimetic rivalry, out of the deadlock of violence? A simple and superficial, superficial reading of mimetic theory gets you the impression that's a pessimistic anthropology, everything is violent, everything will turn out uh, bad and, and it will end in a catastrophe. And well, the evidence of our history and the development gives some evidence to that, so its uh, mimetic theory is not naive and should not be naive. But I think ba the basic insight of Girard is he criticizes at the same time social sciences which uh, deny the fragility of human relations and the very likelihood of conflicts among us, and we see it in our families and with our friends and all the time, if we are honest. But at the same time, he always claims mimetic desire is intrinsically good. So I often feel Girard at his best is like Dostoevsky. Uh, the apocalypse is possible, not unlikely, but the kingdom of God can start in the next hour if we all would just uh, uh, turn around. And I think that's a Christian attitude. Uh, to live, uh, to expect uh, in some way, or to not be too much surprised if things do not go well, but always living out of a deep hope uh, that uh, the message of Christ is not for nothing and futile.